Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your hands and just begin to worship God right now. Just tell Him that you're hungry and that you're desperate. You're hungry for Him to touch you and to move in this place. Lord, we are hungry in this place. We are thirsty and desperate for you, for your presence, for your move, for your touch. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied. Amen. I want everything God has for me. How about you? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just bless the Lord this morning one more time. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Sorry. I'm going to have to direct traffic for a second. Praise God. Judah, bring me my Bible, please. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready for the word this morning? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> Amen. I'm ready to give it. I had a plan for this Sunday and next Sunday, and then Gail opened her mouth, and the whole thing got shot to smithereens. And... Um, Thank God for it. I'd rather do what God says than to do what I think. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. amen. So grab your Bible with me and turn, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. Hallelujah. Isaiah 60 and verse 1 is where we'll begin today. If you have it, say, I got it. That's about half of you. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon you, and his glory shall be seen had a very interesting experience last Sunday. The whole time Gail was talking, I was listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the more she spoke prophetically, the more God gave me. So this week's sermon prep was real easy. I sat down and wrote what he said. And so this morning is not even a sermon as much as it is God, God is sounding the alarm to us. And more than to us, I believe God is trying to wake up the church. So Isaiah 60 verse 2 says that darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness shall cover the people. You can just go on social media and tell that darkness is covering the face of the earth. You can turn on the local news. Uh, I mean, if you do that, that's fine. I don't. I try to stay away from things that are depressing. <laughs> but right now, can we, if we don't agree on anything else, can we at least agree on this? There's great darkness in the earth right now. Yes. Can we also agree that there's great darkness on the people? Yes. Even people, have you, have you noticed that those that have always been on fire for God are burning hotter than they ever have before. Those that were cold against God are colder than they've ever been before. And those that were on the fence that had one foot in the church and another foot in the world now have both feet in the world. Have you noticed that? That whoever you were before the pandemic, you're even more of that now. Darkness has covered the face of the earth, and I believe it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to get up. Amen. Come on, shout that with me. It's time to get up. It's time for us to get up. The Bible refers to us as a sleeping giant, and it is time. Gail came in here last week like a Holy Ghost alarm clock, right? There was some folks that were trying to snooze her, but that didn't work. Amen. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to get up. It's time for us to stand up, to speak up, and to rise up. Amen. Amen? It is not, we don't have time for fear. We don't have time for hiding. Look, can, I, can I just say a thing? 
Dwelling in the secret place is not hiding from the darkness. Dwelling in the secret place of the Almighty under the shadow of His wings is not hiding from the pandemic. It is being strengthened in the midst of a pandemic. I am not hiding from the devil. He has nothing on me. I'm not hiding from demons. They can't do anything to me. I'm not hiding from negative things. It's time for me to rise up. Somebody shout yes. Rise up in the midst of darkness and be who God has called us to be. I, am not, I don't believe in the rapture because I want to escape. Or because I'm fearful of the Antichrist. You, can, <laughs> you cannot be fearful of the Antichrist when you're filled with Christ. Are you here? So now is not time for fear. It's not time for hiding. And we're not going back down. Now, I know, I know you survived by two points, but Florida did not back down, and that's the spirit of this preacher right here. <laughs> you understand? Some of y'all might not know what I'm talking about. I'm going to be good, but i got to stand up and say this. Florida was down 21-3 to 3 in the first quarter, and it could have been a blowout. Matter of fact, had I called Greg, he would have told me it was all over. But, but, he, but down in Gainesville, we don't back down, we don't stay silent, and we actually shut them down for the second and the third quarter. I ain't going to get no help right there, but that's okay. But my point is, if, if that can happen in a football game, right, like when the Chiefs forgot to play defense for the full, whole first half last week, but they didn't back down. Well, if it's true in sports, how much more true is it in the spirit that we have reached a point where we cannot back down? We cannot back down. We cannot fear mandates. We cannot fear what the government's trying to do. We cannot fear what everybody else is trying to do. We cannot back down. We will not be bullied. We will not be shoved into a corner and told what we have to do. This is still the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's time for us to get up. Say, get up. It's time for us to rise and to wake from our slumber. Shout that with me. It's time to arise. The word arise is an interesting word because the word arise simply means to get up or to awaken. And the church, not this church, but the church, is like trying to awaken a 15-year-old teenager on Monday morning when it's time for school. Can I get a witness in here? Last week, last week, last Monday was Judah's birthday. He's 15 now. 15 going on 12. He's 15 years old, and it's his birthday, his mama says. At 6.30 in the morning, I heard her. Judah? Don't forget you need a shower this morning. I'm not stupid. I didn't just get married. She wasn't telling Judah. She was telling me. Look at the guilt. Look at the guilt. She wasn't telling that boy you need a shower. She was telling her husband, make sure he gets a shower. If any husband's in this place right now that knows what I'm talking about, you scared to say amen and you know it. So I get in there. Seven o'clock. We got an hour. Judah, you got to get up. You got to wake up. You got to take your shower. You got to brush your teeth. You got to cook your lunch. Cook his lunch? He's only 15. No, he is 15. He can cook his own stinking lunch. Because it's the same lunch every single day. Chicken fries and apple slices. If you have the apple slices. Get up, put the oven on. Put your chicken on. Get your breakfast. I'll crack the eggs, you cook the eggs. I have to stay off my feet, otherwise I'd, I'd cook his breakfast. It's his birthday, he deserved a nice breakfast. But my foot was yelling at me, so I decided I'd sit down, I'd crack his eggs, you do the rest. 7.05, no Judah. 7.10, no Judah. 7.15, no Judah. Go back in there, Judah, happy birthday, buddy. Thanks, Dad. Get up, take your shower, brush your teeth, cook your lunch. Fix your breakfast. We got to go to school in 45 minutes. Go back out. Start looking at my phone. 
Start doing this. Now, meanwhile, Josiah's out there. Josiah's been out there because he tries to get as much iPad time before he has to leave for school than he possibly can. So Josiah's out there having a good time. He doesn't eat breakfast at the house because they got free breakfast at the school. And he'd, and he'd rather eat breakfast at the school because he can eat things at the school that mama won't let him eat in the house. Huh? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's my struggle right here. And so 715, no Judah. 725, no Judah. I'll go back in there. Happy birthday, buddy. Get up! <laughs> 7.30, no Judah. 7.34, I hear the door open. Well, it's about time. Congratulations, congratulations. Now you don't have time for a shower, so you stink <laughs> on your birthday. Go cook your chicken. I'll crack your eggs. You got to get going. And sometimes that kind of reflects how we are in our spiritual lives. And even though we know we need to get up, it's not the getting up that is stopping us. It's what we're in that we got to get up out of that's stopping us. Hey, no, but before we judge Judah too harshly, have we ever been in the place where we said the bed is too warm? To get up, I'm going to take it a step further because it's summertime still, is to comfy to get up out of this. And I'm here to tell you that that is what the enemy wants you to believe, that what you're in is comfortable, so there's no need to get out of the thing that's comfortable. But the thing that you're in may be comfortable, but if it's not what God sent then we got to get up out of it. Look at somebody and say, you need to get up. So what are some things that God is saying we got to arise from? Number one, slumber. Slumber. Rolling over. Covering up. Slumber. Well, Pastor, slumbering ain't bad. After all, it's called a slumber party. No, but slumber is bad. Because slumber means that, they, that you are spiritually tired. And instead of waking up out of your slumber, we settle in to what it is that has rocked us asleep. Number two, we've got to arise out of apathy. Can somebody tell me what the word apathy means? Huh? Don't care. Judah, you've got to take your shower. Hmm. Apathy, don't care. I don't care if I take a shower, right? And that's, there's too much of the church, not here, thank God, but there's too much of the church that quite frankly are pathetic because they're apathetic. They don't care. I don't care that the neighborhood across town is going to hell. Everything in my house is all right. It's not caring. We don't care that women are being battered and bruised. We don't care that children are being traded like cards. We don't care that kids are overdosing on heroin. We don't care that the world seems to be celebrating the murder of unborn babies. How do I know we don't care? Because we're not doing anything about it. Apathy. Three. I'm just going to preach on you today, son. Laziness. Laziness. Somebody else will do it. And then when we are forced to rise, when we are forced to get up, our laziness takes over because we complain because we're the only one that has to do this job, like taking out the trash. Why am I the only one that has to do this? You're not, but you can't. Time is too short for us to be lazy. Our worship is lazy. I'm not going to do that because I don't like that song. I'm just going to sit here until I get my song. But why should we allow God's worship to suffer just because our preferences aren't being met? Thank you. Laziness. Selfishness. Kind of basically what I just said, isn't it? Selfishness. If it doesn't affect me, then I don't care. If I'm not disturbed, then I'm not going to do anything to change it. We've got to rise up out of our selfishness. Our selfishness. I didn't get anything out of that sermon. What did you put into it? 
I didn't get anything out of the service today. I didn't get a thing. I'm going to a different church. Why? Well, let's see. You didn't worship. You didn't tithe. You didn't say amen to the word. I wonder why you didn't get anything out of it. Okay, all right, all right. I'm having fun. Shall we keep going? Pride. I talked, to, I talked to Polly this morning about this. Some people have so much pride that they can't even see they're a danger unto themselves. Pride. Well, you know, a lot of people get, get in this weird place because everything they say starts with I. I don't like that. I didn't get that. I didn't receive that. I was offended by that. Pride. Pride's an awful thing, ain't it? I was going to give an example, but I'm, going to keep, I'm, going, I'm just going to move on because we're on Facebook and I don't want to get in trouble. Okay. I don't, I don't want that conversation this afternoon. <laughs> Pride's a horrible thing. When you care more about how people perceive you than you care about reaching people, there's a major problem. Y'all know what I'm trying to say? There's a major problem when you are the center of your own equation. I, I, I can't do that. People would. What about getting so? <laughs> a pastor friend of mine in Florida said this. How, how is the world going to tell us we need to be woke when they are in sleep themselves? So how are we supposed to wake up unless we have a connection with the God that can wake us up? Coasting. Coasting, coasting, like knowing you need to do math, but figure somebody else will get to it or I can do it another time. I'm not going to point any fingers at anybody. Coasting, what is coasting? Coasting is the lack of putting effort into something. I'm just going to, I just coast through. Why? Look, cruise control is great. But there's no effort in cruise control because the machine is designed to do everything by itself. And if we approach the things of the kingdom with a coasting cruise control mentality, then we will never become everything that God wants us to become. It's time for us to wake up. Stop coasting. Stop coasting. Well, I, don't, I don't have to read the word in my house. Pastor's going to tell me what the word says on Sunday. That's coasting. That's coasting. Okay, cruises are great, but not in the spirit. Cruises are great for vacation. But a cruise isn't how you're supposed to travel on the regular, right? Unless you're retired. I was waiting for somebody to say amen. (laughs) Fear. We've got to arise out of fear because of the what if syndrome. What if I'm not received? What if I don't have it in me? What if I fail? What if you don't? Furthermore, the what if I want to ask is, what if you don't arise, what will happen to the people God wants to send you to? I'm not beating beating us up. I'm trying to get us to think and take some inventory. Are we asleep or are we woke? Are we awake? Are we alert? I'm in here like a big old cup of java. I got you. I got you. Your high test diesel coffee for you today. I want us to wake up and rise up and be everything that God has called us to be. How about you? Panic. Well, we're not thought, we've talked about that before. Toilet paper mean anything to you? Panic. Please, please, please stop buying everything in the store and hiding it in your basement. Then the rest of us, then the rest of us are stuck to use tortillas for toilet paper, and it ain't pretty. (laughs) How you like that visual? Okay, praise God. (laughs) Panic, depression. But the most dangerous thing that I want to talk to you about today is the thing that I want us to wake out of, and that is going through the motions. We just go through the motions. Sing with no passion, worship with no feeling, Pray with no fire, preach with no conviction, and we get stuck going through the motions. The Bible says that it's having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. 
But I want to declare today, as for me and my church, we will rise. We're not going to sit here asleep. We are not going to be wrapped up in the blankets of religion and be lulled to sleep because darkness is in the earth. The very fact that darkness is in the earth is proof positive His glory is in the earth as well. We will rise. We need to stand up to be seen. We need to speak out to be heard. And we need to rise. Because the reality is, if we don't, who will? And if not now, then when? We've got to rise. We have got to rise, and it is time that we stop cowering in fear. It is time. Let me tell you something right now. Let me tell you something right now. And I don't, I, listen, this is going to offend some folks, and I'm sorry. And I, I've told you before, I'm neither Republican nor Democrat, I'm kingdom. But I'm going to say this. The Church of America, I'm not even going to look at nobody. The Church of America, that didn't work out very well, did it? (laughs) The Church of America has allowed politicians to tell them how to operate. And I'm just going to say this. No, I'm not. (laughs) Okay, yes, I will. We will not be dictated to in this house by Washington or Jefferson City. Period. Period. Thank God we have a governor that's not dictating to us. But our nation does not have a leader. Our nation has a dictator. Robbing us of our freedom. Robbing us of our ability to choose for ourselves. And is pushing the agenda through fear and panic. No longer are we a nation where we are supposed to do what is best for us and our family. We have now become a nation of how dare you do that for your neighbor. And I'm not going to go down the trail of vaccine. I Actually, I probably already have, but anyway. Where do Pastor Kimberly and I, I'm sorry, Kimberly, she doesn't like to be called pastor anymore. Where do Kimberly and I stand? If you want to get the vaccine, we support you 110%. If you don't want to get the vaccine, we support you 110%. But we are 150% against a politician telling you that you have to in order to have a job. time for us to to arise say arise Arise. but the second thing isaiah said in this passage is that we are ought to shine to shine it's time for the bride of christ to shine to shine means to give forth light or to be radiant the reality is simply this is that transform lives will transform lives matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 let's look at this together Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The reality is, is that if you and I aren't actually doing something, then there is nothing to shine. Right? Look at somebody and say, you better shine. Come on, say it again. It's time to shine. So what is it then that the church needs to shine in? Number one, you've got to shine God's love for humanity. I'm going to tell you this, that the church of Jesus Christ has done a very poor job at shining the love of God and has done a very good job at shining the judgment of God. You understand what I'm trying to say? Well, well, I'm just letting my light shine. i got to tell everybody they're wrong. That's not shining. That's putting the nasty taste in somebody's mouth. You are the salt of the earth, a city set up on a hill. But if the salt has has lost its... Wherewith will the earth then be salted? So in other words, if you lose the light of God to shine, then what are we shining? We shine criticism. We shine judgment. We shine punishment. But we haven't been shining the grace and love and the mercy and the power and the glory of God. And it's time 
Listen, we got to let we we got to let the world know we don't serve a God that beats us over the brow. We serve a God that loves us. I said it before, I'm going to say it again. We don't serve the God that says that you have to that you have to die for me. He says I died for you so that you can live. And we've got to let that shine. Number 2, we need to let his unlimited power shine. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. One of my favorite stories of Smith Wigglesworth was this. He was on a train reading his Bible. Out, not out loud, within himself. A businessman came onto the train, sat there very uncomfortably. And halfway through the train ride, he gets up, throws his briefcase down, falls on his knees, points a finger at Smith Wigglesworth, and said, Sir, you convict me of my sin. Smith Wigglesworth looked at him and said, But I didn't say a word. He said, Not what you said but what's in you convicts me of what's in me. I'm telling you, if we would just live right, we wouldn't have to let nobody know what they're doing is wrong. I want us to be so full of his unlimited power, so full of his conviction, so full of his glory, so full of his power that we don't have to let anybody know that we are saved. One of the saddest things in the world that anybody ever said to me is, they didn't even know I was a Christian. Why not? Not because I told them I was a Christian, but because of how I lived my life. To be so full of his unlimited power that blind people walk in, but they walk out seeing. To be so full of his power, deaf people walk in and they can hear before they leave. To be so full of his power that people that don't have the ability can talk, gets their tongue loose and they can now speak in their known language right in the presence of God. I want this church so full of power that a drug dealer walk in and he will lay his drugs on the altar and walk out of here and not ever do it again. That's what I'm talking about. So full of his unlimited power. So full of his unlimited power that limbs grow back. (laughs) Whatever got amputated, whoop, there it is. It grew back. That's what I'm talking about. A.A. Allen, well known in the 50s with tent revivals. R.W. Schambach writes of a time he was with A.A. Allen and right in the midst of it, there was a lady who came forward who had her hand cut off at the wrist. He looked down under her hand. She had beautiful jewelry. She had red nail polish. Dressed to the nines. Very well put together. But but she had had a disease and all she had was a stub at the wrist. A. A. Allen looked at her and said, will you believe God? And she said, I will believe anything you say. He said, it's not me, it's God. And then he said this, not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Ghost. I command a hand to grow. And right there in the presence of thousands of people, a brand new hand grew right out from the front with matching nail polish. (laughs) Oh, but God doesn't care. God cares about what you care about. And I believe God grew that hand with red nail polish on that hand to prove to everybody God don't care about red nail polish. Because in the 50s, if you wore red nail polish, you were a heathen. Help me out, somebody. I want to be so full of power, people walk in here. Let me tell you something right now. Let me tell you something right now. I'm believing God for crazy, stupid, impossible miracles. Crazy stuff. People walk in with three toes and walk out with five. Pastor, that's ridiculous. You got that right. I'm telling you, I've already seen it. I've already seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it in my spirit. People with goiters hanging off their necks, dropping right there in the altar, completely healed with fresh baby skin on their neck. We've got to show forth His unlimited power. I'm going to tell you something right now. I've, I've, I've seen it in my spirit. God doing crazy, creative miracles that reverses dementia and Alzheimer's. I've seen it in my prayer time. I've seen it. Well, Pastor, that's impossible. No, that's God. We need to show forth the tangible presence of the king. It's, the, it's, it's that, what do we mean by tangible? You can touch it. You can feel it. It moves on you. It touches you. you it's like there's something in the room. Something in the room. 
What was that old song about angels passing by? I can feel the something of angels' wings. What, what is that song? The Lord is in this place. How's that song go? You'll get it in a second. But y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all, do you know the song I'm talking about? I can feel the brush of angels' wings. See His glory. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His, His mighty power and His grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. See His glory on each face. For surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I want atheists leaving here saying, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place. I want politicians who want to murder babies to come in here and leave saying, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place. I want gang leaders coming in here and leaving here with their guns on the altar saying, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I want homosexuals and lesbians in and transsexuals walking in here and leaving here delivered saying, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I don't want us to be another cold, dead, plucked up by the roots uh, graveyard of a church. I want us to be alive and on fire. I want us to wake up and realize His glory is in this place. I want us to be a place that shows, shows forth the praises of God. I've said before, I'm going to say it again. Whatever, however you need to give God praise, you can do it in here. You ain't going to scare me. I've been in this thing for 44 years. You ain't going to scare me. I hesitate to say this, but I believe I've seen just about anything that a man can see in revival. But I already know I haven't, Rocky. But I ain't scared of nothing. But what I am scared of is missing God. What I am scared of is being so dead and dry that I don't know that I'm dead and dry. And I'm going to say it again and I'll say it to my dying breath. There's nothing you can do to glorify the name of Jesus that will offend me. If you want to shout, you shout. If you want to dance, you dance. If you want to run, you run. If you want to get up on a chair and do a Texas two-step, go ahead and do it. If you want to run around the building, if we want to do a Jericho march, if you want to scream until you lose your voice, I don't care. But what I do care about is that God has His way in this house. My wife said to me, as my boys were singing annoyingly loud this morning, and I just said, I said, wow, they're loud. And she said something in jest, but it hit my spirit. She said, well, we didn't raise our children to be quiet in church. And I laughed and I sat down and I, and I said to myself, thank God. Thank God. That I didn't, I didn't raise my children. That church is supposed to be a place where you're quiet as a mouse. Because my God is worthy of a greater praise than that. Amen. And my kids aren't, aren't ashamed to give God praise. And I thank God for that. Well, I don't think it takes all that. I don't think you need to jump up and down. But I also don't think that it takes sitting like a bump on a log to act like you're holy when we know you're not. I'm sorry, that came off way too rough. I apologize. But you understand my point? But they're just teenagers. You know, somebody said that to me one time when I was 17. And I preached like I do every time. I preached like my hair was on fire. Because there might be somebody there who's on their way to a burning hell. So every time I preach, I try to preach like my hair's on fire, like it's my last opportunity. I gave it everything that I had. And the pastor came to me and he said, boy, that was something else. I said, really? I was 17. I didn't know he was setting me up to insult me. He goes, you know, all that energy, all that fire. He goes, but you know, when you get seasoned, you won't act like that. <laughs> I was not as mature as I am now. <laughs> I didn't have as much control over my tongue as I do now. Some of y'all didn't even know I had control over my tongue. That's okay. I looked at him, 17 years old. I looked at him and I said, well, 
I said, so seasoning, as in maturity, is that right? Yes, son, that's right. I said, well, if that's maturity, I said, if acting like you means being mature, slap a diaper on my butt and give me a passy. That's a direct quote. He said, a diaper and a passy. He said, why would you say that? I said, because you say maturity is being unmoved by the presence of God. And I refuse to live my life that way. And if that means being mature, I'll be a baby all my life. We're living in a time where we don't have firebrands behind the pulpit. We got six foot icicles. Not here. I refuse. Because the sacrifice Jesus paid and what God wants to do in your life is greater than acting like we don't know the truth. We got to let his praises shine. Amen. Why? Because of this. Let me, let me try to hurry this up. I don't even feel like I've preached today. I feel like I've just ranted. I'm sorry. Because the Bible says that our light has come. Arise, get up, shine, show forth, be brilliant, be radiant. Why? Because our light has come. Light. Light, it, the Hebrew word for light is or, O-H-R. O-H-R. The word or means simply this. It's the light of Zion. It is the fire in the favor of God. So when he says to get up and when he says to shine, it is because we have already received the fire in the favor of God. It's the light of Zion. It is time for the church to show out his glory. The world needs to see the brightness of his glory on his people. You know, some people, not around here, because, it, I mean, if it was, I probably would have already had a conversation with you that, you know, there's something wrong and you need deliverance. But I've, let me explain something. I've been in over 41 different states, preached in hundreds of churches in this great nation of ours. And everywhere that I've gone, and we've pastored in Maine, pastored in New Jersey, pastored in Ohio, evangelized in over 80% of this nation. And I see it everywhere I go. People that come to church that are not awake and they're not shining. No, they walk in like they just drank a gallon of dill pickle juice on their way to church. Their chin is buried into their chest. Their eyes are droopy. There's no joy on their countenance. Because we fail to remember that the Bible says why. I'm going to do it in King James because my son likes it. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Hope thou in God. We come to church sad and depressed. And because there's no light or favor or glory or power or presence, then we take that same weight home with us. If you are heavy laden, if you are burdened, if you are weighed down, this is exactly where you need to be. Because you and I have an invitation to come to the altar and to lay it down. To leave it at the foot of the cross, to, to take the burden and leave it there. Jesus said, come to me, not you who are perfect, but all you who are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. It's all right to come into church sad, stressed out, burdened. It's not all right to leave church in the same condition. It is all right to come to church knowing that you failed God this week. Maybe you fought with your kids on the way to church. Maybe you yelled at the drivers on the way to church. Maybe you cussed your spouse out in your head on the way to church. Pastor, what kind of people do you think we are? Human. Huh? I don't cuss out loud. And my point is, that's all right. It's okay. You're human. We make mistakes. We're frail beings. But it's not okay. 
for the church to be void of his power that changes me when I walk into the building. It's not all right for the church to be empty of the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. It is not all right for us to be a religious social club. It is not all right for us to act like God isn't who he said he is. If this study on Wednesday nights has done anything to me, it has realized that I don't praise him like I should. That he's better than my praise. He's worthy of more. He's worthy of more. And I'm here to tell you that no matter how you came in here this morning, you can leave different. You can leave different. It might happen while you worship. It might happen when Pastor Jerry is exhorting. It might happen during the message or in the altar. My point is you don't have to leave. You remember that old song? This is Old Song Sunday for some reason. You won't leave here. This is an old Holy Ghost camp meeting song. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame. But the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. And you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Y'all, I know you know that song. I know you grew up on that song. But y'all know what I'm saying? We, we, when, you, when you make the decision to water down the gospel, close the altars, and shut tongues down, you are making the decision for people to leave with the same burdens that they carried in. And we're not going to be that church. We are a church on fire. Anything can happen, and it probably will. Amen? Habakkuk chapter 2. Look at this promise. What time is it? Is it time for me to stop? Just about. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Does anybody know what percentage of the earth is covered by water? Huh? 70% of the earth is covered by by water. And the earth shall be covered with the knowledge of the glory of God. What if 70% of Callaway County got a knowledge of the glory of God? (laughs) What if 70% of Missouri got filled with the knowledge of the glory of God? Huh? Huh? Washington wouldn't be telling us what to do. We would start telling Washington what to do. Let me close with this. Say this with me. I am filled filled with the light light of his glory. glory. The Bible says that even though darkness covers the face of the earth, yet my glory will rest upon you. Three things I want to tell you. Number one, darkness will not dim his glory. Have you ever... Have you ever been in a pitch black room and somebody lit a match? Not a candle, a match. The smallest light overpowers the greatest darkness. The smallest light overpowers the greatest darkness. And we've been hearing a lot about how dark the world is. My concern is that there's too much darkness in the church. And it's time to arise and shine. Wickedness will not prevail. Don't be, you know what Peter said? He said this. He said, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial that you were in. Don't think it that some strange thing has come upon you when God already said in the last days, perilous times shall come. Don't think it weird. It's not weird that men are acting wickedly. It's prophecy come to pass. I told you, way back in January, it's now almost October. Nine months ago, I told you that this would be an interesting year because the number 21 means wickedness. Do you remember that? The number 21 means wickedness, and now we're surprised because we've seen wickedness. And the point is not for us to live in wickedness. The point is to Arise and shine and let our light, let our light enter the room. It's time to get up. It's time to shine. I was reminded of this. Uh, for, I'm, I'm really done. Uh, I was, but I was reminded of this yesterday. Not everything on Facebook's bad. 
Um, but somebody had posted, said, uh, you know, some of y'all were not woken up by your parents singing, rise and shine and give God the glory, glory, and you can tell. It's just kind of, kind of a funny way to say it. But y'all, did, did anybody's parents do that to you? No? Did you do it to your kids? How many have no, I know y'all did. How, how many have no earthly idea what I'm talking about? Some of y'all. Did you grow up that way? Did your parents do that to you? Something like that? I bet your mother did. Yes. yes. Good morning. <laughs> My parents didn't do it on Sunday. They didn't do it on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. But every God bless it Saturday morning. My only morning to sleep. My mother would come in there early in the morning on Saturday. Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Annoying. Mom, I know you're watching, but it was annoying. I'm sitting there trying to sleep and my mother comes in. Not, good morning, sweetheart. Tim, it's time to wake up. Rise and shine. Please stop, stop, stop. But all joking aside, the reality is that is exactly what God is saying to us this morning. It's time for us to rise and shine. It's time, look, in church, no, we're already shining in here. But arise out of what we're in. Arise out of that comfort zone and shine. Shine at work. Shine at the grocery store. Shine at the park. Amen. Amen. Shine wherever you go. Live your life in a way that when people look at you, they ask you, what is different about you? Like, I don't know what it is, but you, you're on something. What are you on? What kind of vitamins do you take? Are you on drugs? You drinking early in the day? What's your deal? And then you'll say, I'm filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. I'm filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. I believe, I believe this, you can write it down, I believe the greatest outpouring of the light and the fire and the favor of God, the greatest outpouring of His glory is coming to this place. Hallelujah. I, I feel it in my belly. I see it in my dreams. When I pray, I feel it coming. And as she said, I'm still hungry after all these years. I'm still thirsty after all these years. I got saved at the age of five, filled with the Holy Ghost at the age of 10. Started preaching at the age of 16. I've had the privilege of preaching in over 41 different states in three different provinces of Canada. I've preached in Belgium in five different villages. And I'm more hungry now than I've ever been in my entire life. And I've seen crazy stuff make, I've seen stuff that make people rub their eyes. I've seen people who couldn't walk take a leg brace off their leg and run laps around the church completely pain-free. I've seen one, one lady's leg grew four inches right there in front of my face. I saw a lady that was blind as a bat. She was as blind, could not see, and in a moment took off those glasses, opened her eyes, and began to scream, I can see, I can see, I can see, I can see. I saw a lady with a goiter on her neck the size of a softball. And in the presence of God, it detached off her neck and fell flat in the front of that church with brand new skin all over her neck. But I'm more hungry than I've ever been. I've seen some stuff you wouldn't hardly believe. I've, I saw a teenage girl in Belgium spin, frothing at the mouth, foam at the mouth with, with this demonic voice speaking out, out of her. And then I watched my wife take authority over it and command it to stop. And then I saw the peace of God descend on her. And as she got delivered and refilled with the Holy Ghost, and I've seen some crazy stuff that you would not hardly be able to wrap your minds around. But I know something greater is on the way. Something greater is on the way. Do you believe it? Yes, Something greater is on the way. Look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against serving coffee and donuts in the foyer. I'm not against fellowships and I'm not against any of that stuff. I just choose to believe that the presence of God will attract more than having the best coffee and donuts. Amen. I believe that.
You know, I'm, I'm not, and I think those things are wonderful fe- for fellowship and encouraging people to come to church and come, come for a free cup of coffee and let's hang out and let's worship God together. And I'm all for all that stuff. But I am not for thinking that that is what will grow the church. What will grow the church is the fire and the glory of God burning right here. Right here. Amen. Stand or I'm just going to keep talking. Well, see, that, that shows you want me to shut up. Okay, praise God. <laughs> Amen. My question is, are, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you desperate? Are you longing? Are you wanting? I believe that's why God sent us here. Not because we're the ones to bring revival, but because God has something special for this county. You know, if I was just going to move somewhere just to move somewhere, no offense. <laughs> wouldn't have been Callaway County. I'm just saying. I wouldn't have relocated my family just to live and work a job. Probably wouldn't have chose mid-Missouri. You know? Probably would have been somewhere by water or in the mountains. Definitely not New York or California. Anyway. But when I pray and I say, God, where are you sending us and what do you want to do? He said, I'm sending you to Missouri because I know that you will do whatever I tell you to do. And he said, I want to build a hub for my move. And I believe we are going to be the epicenter of the spirit of revival. But but it's going to cost us something. There's a high price price to be paid for a move of God next Sunday I'm going to be preaching a message entitled the cost of revival don't don't miss it because there's a price you and I have to pay but I'm willing to pay that price how about you I'm willing to have my schedule messed up I'm willing to have my clothes messed up I'm willing for God to do I'm telling I want the kind of move of God Brother, I want the kind of move of God that when I walk out here, I look like I didn't even bother to get my clothes ironed that morning. I won't be so jacked up because of what God did. People are like, dear Lord, should have at least ironed your shirt. I'm serious. I was in a revival one time, Zach. The dude walked out to church with one sock on and one sock off. I'm not making that up. When I say I want God to do something that will rip your socks off, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We had a lady, I was in Augusta, Georgia. I'm sorry, I told you to stand. I was in Augusta, Georgia between my first and second year of Bible college. And this guy said, I want, I've heard all about you. I want you to preach. I'm like, how'd you hear about me? That's ridiculous. He's like, so this Sunday morning, God moved crazy stuff. And this lady came in and she's like, you know, uh, that's fine for everybody else, but I'm not going down. I, I, don't, I don't fall. I don't get slain in the spirit. I don't do all these things you holy rollers do. And she's wearing this long, beautiful dress. I remember, I called her out. I said, come here. She stood before me. I said, lift your hands. She lifted her hands. And I said, I don't know you or what you are hungry for. I remember to this day what I said. I said, but God's about to hit you like a tidal wave. And when she went down, her dress went up. (laughs) Exposed her. We were running for drop cloths. We call them drop cloths. Uh, What do you call it? Modesty cloths and all that. All of us were wearing suits and jackets, but not one man took his jacket off to cover her. I thought, oh, dear God, I'll never see this lady again. They're going to kick me out of this city. I will never be able to preach in this church for the rest of my life. That was Sunday morning. We were scheduled through Wednesday. Sunday night, I said to Pastor, I said, we'll never see that lady again. He's like, no, we won't. He's like, I know her. She'll never come back. She walked in just before church started. Sweatpants. sweatshirt tucked into the sweatpants i said what i said what are you doing she goes i came ready for you tonight she goes you ain't doing that to me again when i say the holy ghost will cost you something it'll mess you up we ain't got to worry about that we have a bunch of jeans and short wearing people around here so (laughs) praise god amen lift your hands let's pray before we're stuck here all day father in jesus name We declare that we are hungry, we're thirsty, we're desperate for you. 
And God, I pray that every single person that's here this morning will arise, that you will wake us up. You're sounding the alarm for us to get up, to get up out of whatever we're in. You're sending the alarm. You're, you're telling us, God, that now is the time for us to shine. And I pray, God, for every person here that they will begin to shine the glory of God. Help us to rise out of our slumber, out of our apathy, out of our laziness. Arise out of our pride. Help us to get up out of the things that we've been stuck in. And help us to shine. To show forth your glory, to show forth your presence. God, send revival in ways that we can't even fathom. Move in this house in ways that we've never encountered. In Jesus' name, we pray for the lost of our city. Give us a vision for the lost. Give us eyes for the wounded. Give us eyes for the depressed. Give us eyes for those that want nothing to do with you. And God, would you move in such a way that even those who do not desire you encounter you and have their lives changed in Jesus' name. Place one hand on your belly and one hand in the air. Father, I pray for every person here that they will get up out of whatever they're in. They will arise. Say that with me. I will will. arise Arise. and shine shine. and show forth his glory. glory. I'm going to say it again. I will arise arise. and shine, shine. show forth his glory. glory. Now lift up both your hands and just begin to worship God for a moment. Open your mouth and love on him. Open your mouth and love on him. Every stronghold be broken in the name of Jesus. Every stronghold be destroyed in the name of Jesus. We worship our way out of this, God. We worship our way up and out of whatever we're stuck in in the name of Jesus. We exalt you. We lift you up. We magnify your holy name. Great are you, Lord, and greatly are you to be praised. In the mountain of God, in the city of holiness, we exalt your holy name. We exalt your holy name. We exalt your holy name. Shimon no ma be korma se te mahate brashi ko ba su te ama da na ma ko ba ha sa ta na ma hete brashi ko fa san te anda ra masaya broshi ko na ma te ko ra va san ra mo ko fa se ba do ra ma ke shambo sai ya no ma sa ta ki ora ma sho for I will say unto you this day. I have already determined to pour out my spirit. But I am calling you to rise and to stand and to move forward in what it is I've anointed this place for. For I have decided, I have decided to mark this house by my presence, to mark it by my glory. That this is a place I have set my name. And I will be glorified in this place. I will be lifted up in this place. I will be exalted with your praise. And I will draw them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Yea, even those who have promised to never darken the doors of this building will find themselves returning with humility and sacrifice. For I am pulling the hungry together and I will build my church, says the Lord. Somebody give God praise this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, give God praise. Give God a praise. Hallelujah.
Lord, you spoke and we ask that you do it. Move in this house by your power and your glory in Jesus' name. Life is, uh, the journey of life is a lot like the hills of Jeff City. You're up and down and up and down and up and down and curving around, right? And as I um, was down there this morning, I kept sensing God saying, you know, when we're going through life and we go, we're making our way up a mountain that's a trial and then we're on the mountain and things feel good and then we're coming down. We have a tendency, like when we've been teaching Jillian how to drive in Jeff City because of all the places to learn how to drive, that's, a, you know, can be a little daunting. And so we had to teach her that when you are going up a hill, you've got to accelerate. You're never going to get on the top if you don't accelerate. Anybody tried that? Okay. I had to learn this when we moved here, too. Like, I wasn't used to driving in hills. And then when you're on the top, you're good, and you're staying pretty level, and then you start going down, you got to come off the accelerator and just coast, right? Well, a lot of us, we when we're on the top of the mountain and we've just gotten through a trial and everything seems great at that point, and you're like, finally, that is over. I can just chill for a while, right? And I can coast. And we put it, not necessarily on cruise control, but we take our foot off the accelerator and say, you know, I've been doing a lot to get to the top of this mountain and feel like I've gotten through whatever this trial or tribulation was, and now I just don't feel like bothering to do anything. I'm just going to enjoy this while I'm here. But see, you know, you're only on the mountain for so long in life, and then you start to descend, and you're going down again, and we coast. And I'm not saying we should do that spiritually, but sometimes we do that. But here's the thing is at the bottom of the hill, there's going to be where you got to go up another one, just like in Jeff City. And you will never, ever reach the top of another mountain and overcome anything if you constantly stay in the coasting mode. Because when you're down at the bottom, I've tried it. And you, you have been coasting down, and you've got good speed. you got actually have to put the brake on. So you don't go too fast, but then when it starts going back up, you will never get to the top, or it's going to take you forever to feel like you ever reach anything. So I just want to admonish you this morning, don't coast anymore. If that's where you've been, let today be the end, and get your foot on the accelerator spiritually and advance in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. We love you. Be blessed, and have a great week.